So, from manufacturer to ultimate consumer, the main link in our economic system are the salesmen. 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 Hey everybody, I'm Clint. Welcome to the Salesman's Guide to Beer and Business. Today, we have uh, a former business owner, a sales associate turned sales manager. Uh, it is the one, the only, Ozon Dake. Oz, thank you for being on the show today. Hey man, I appreciate you having me. Yep. Excited about it. I'm, I'm glad you're here. Uh, today, we are, or you're checking out Log Boats uh, Look Out. Uh, this is a, a pretty good beer. I've actually drank it a couple times now. Um, and it's got a nice citrus flavor. It's got a good, uh, remedy of hops. Uh, some of the things I, I, I wrote down, I, I wrote a little prelim to it. I always, I always like to pour it and see, you know, the, these, you know, craft beers, how, how, how big the head is on, on a good glass. Hopefully everybody can see that. Uh, this is the American pale ale. Um, it has a very bright summer taste to it. Um, I like the little splash of citrus that is in it, and uh, it does have an abundance of flavor with with the hops in there. So it's it's a pretty good beer. This this reminds me of you know in in our business going camping or you know around a campfire, some barbecue. Um, it, it's like I said from Log Boat. They are a Columbia based uh, brewing company. They got their start in 2013 and uh, have have since just skyrocketed uh, ever since. Uh, we will be doing a, a lot on Log Boat just because they are a, a very popular and local brew. Uh, this this one in particular is is just called Lookout. That's the one we're we're going to review today. Um, Oz, have you had a chance to taste that bad boy? Yeah, I've taken just a sip of it, and I, I'm not a fan of a real thick, heavy beer, so this is right up my alley. Um, it's got kind of that, like you said, that little citrus pop to it. Mm -hmm. I really like that. I really do. It's a, uh, it's got a good flavor to it. It's not overbearing. Um, not that huge, uh, that really beery taste to it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, some, some folks might laugh at me for that, but you know, I don't, I'm more the light beer drinker myself. And I think Absolutely. that if you're someone that doesn't like a real thick, heavy beer, this is probably going to be a good one to try out for sure. Well, and, and when it, when it comes to this one in particular, I mean, this is one like on a hot summer day, either you're out, you know, uh, on, on a boat or, or by a campfire having a barbecue. This is one I really feel like you could just drink all day because it's got that good flavor to it. Right. Not one that's just going to be like, yeah, I can have one of these and then I'm done. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've, I've definitely tasted some of those that I'm just like, <laughs> eh, one and done, man. Yeah, one and like, done. It's like a hard shot of whiskey. You're like, yeah, I'm right. good. I'm good after that one. Does anybody else want one of these? <laughs> <laughs> Bought a 12 pack. Only need one. <laughs> right. Oh man. So Oz, how, uh, how, how are you doing today, man? Are you, are you excited to be here? Yeah, I'm good, man. I'm excited. This is uh this is the first time I've done anything like this. So this is sort of a uh, uncharted territory for me as well. Well, uh, I I, I want to, you know, hope you uh, have a good experience here because like I said, this is uh, pretty laid back and simple. This is going to be uh, on, on YouTube. It's going to be on Spotify, Anchor, not to put any pressure on you, but um, oh, we're, we're really hope to, we're, we're just getting kicked off here. I mean, you're, you're, you're coming in on the, the entry level of this. So awesome. uh, I, I hope you get comfortable with it. I'm, I hope you uh, want to come back and, and do another episode with us. So let's uh, let's dive in, man. What is your drink of choice when you you either go out to a bar or sitting at home? What's your drink of choice, man? Everyone's gonna make fun of me if I let this cat out of the bag. Oh, come on now. Okay, it would be a cranberry vodka <coughs> with a splash of Sprite. With a splash of Sprite. Okay. Yep, I know it. I know. That is probably one of the most curly <laughs> drinks out there. Today. I told you, man. Uh, I told you. Okay, we're gonna have to cut this episode. Um, <laughs> we're gonna no. have to edit that out of there. <laughs> we're gonna edit that. Say something manly like whiskey straight. Oh man, just, just uh, whiskey on the rocks. Actually, <laughs> <Woo>. <laughs> no, um, that's just. I don't know. It's just uh, something that I can always. It's it's just one of those things that you can't really mess up. So if mm -hmm. you're pretty, it's kind of the safe bet, I guess, as far as drinks go. Fair enough. And I, I mean, I, I've I've got a special palette myself i mean I, I used to be hardcore like a crown and coke guy mm -hmm. i mean when i would go out or you know if i was just trying to relax have one drink i, I would definitely just drink a crown and coke then the coke started giving me heartburn so i went to crown and sprite and it made it a lot better uh but i mean whiskey in itself is super hard and now i genuinely pretty much only drink beer if i go out or anything 
I know a couple of times y'all, uh, we, we've been out together and, and everybody's like, <laughs> shot, shot, shot. I'm like, oh, no, gosh. man, no, I'm just trying to drink beer over here. Come on down. Oh yeah. No, I know how that goes. I've got, I've got to do that every once in a while too. Well, you know, it's, it's kind of this, like, once again, it's a safe bet, you know, mm-hmm. nice, easy coast your way through the night. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, every, every once in a while, you know, you do have to get that DD. So please right. drive safe, drink responsibility. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so let me ask you this. How did you get your start in sales? What was your first sales position, I should say? So my first sales position um, would actually kind of tie back to, I was uh, I had to do tours at a, uh, at a camp, campgrounds, basically. Okay. Um, it was a five-star camping resort, uh, Lost Valley Lake Resort. It's uh, over there by my hometown in Owensville. So um, I was out there. My friend's dad was the sales manager there. And so he kind of said, Hey guys, you know, if you guys want, you can come in on the weekends and do overage. So if all the other salespeople were taken, then we would have the opportunity to take some folks out tour them around the campsites, around the, all the, all the facilities that we had. And then of course, try to try to make a sale at the end. Okay. So I, I, I'm a little confused because I, obviously I'm new to Missouri and I, I don't know the area. What exactly were you selling? So I was selling, um, it was ownerships is ownership. what we were selling. Okay. Yeah. So you weren't buying into a timeshare. You were buying into an ownership mm. that you could will in to your kids. So you could, you could sell it outright to someone else. If you hop on Craigslist right now or, or marketplace, you could probably hop on there and find some, find some of those packages for sale for this specific resort. Cause I see them out there all the time. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Yep. So, so what was one of your biggest fears into getting into sales. Obviously with, with this aspect, it's a little different from what you're doing now, but like when, when you started out, what was a big fear when you started? So one of the big fears I think I had was, you know, that initial meet and greet with the customer, Mm -hmm. you know, it would be, it was my first time ever doing something like that. Um, I was in a professional setting, which I had not been in. I was, I was still in high school at the time. It was, it was my senior year. Yep. So that part was a little bit, a little bit crazy for me there. But as far as kind of getting the hang of it, um, the biggest part of it, I say, would would have to be that meet and greet. And then once you kind of met that customer or that person that you're going to take on a tour, it kind of the walls kind of came down, and you just got to be yourself and kind of kind of go through the motions. Then absolutely see, and and that's one of the things that I always I always said. You know, that initial contact is, is going to, uh, you know, give you that showcase of how your your process and your sale is going to go and if you're not friendly and and comforting up front it, it's it's going to go downhill from right there, you better right? pack a lunch in that case <laughs> exactly <laughs> cuz i mean if if you're not you know starting to break down those walls as in the meet and greet you know being friendly being you know uh, relatable building that rapport with somebody you're you're not going to get very far with somebody uh trying to sell them anything right and i mean thinking back to it you know that was the first time i'd really ever heard anything about rapport i didn't even know what the hell that was mm-hmm. i was like what what do you want me to do like <laughs> he's like go out there and just make a friend with these guys you know yep. be yourself and and don't don't try to be a robot he said just you know go be yourself show these people a good time You've already done the training. Here's what here's what you need to do. Just just do what you've been trained to do. Exactly. So. And and that's that's what I always tried to do, especially when, you know, I was I was green as could be. I was like, I'm gonna go out there and make a friend before I try and make a sale. You right. know, and, and that's I feel like that's good advice. But yeah. Um so what line of business are you in now? You're not you're not selling uh those anymore. Ownerships. Own, ownerships. Yeah, I'm, I'm not selling ownerships anymore. <laughs> uh, that right now I'm in, I'm in camper sales now, RV sales. Um, so yeah, we do, we do a lot of, uh, drivables, uh, tow behinds, fifth wheels. Um, we handle pretty much everything except for a class B. Oh, wow. Wow. So, um, with you being in, in, in campers and, and obviously the experience of camping, um, how, how did you get to that position? Cause I know you started as a sales professional, right? right. Yep. And, uh, you've made it all the way up to sales management, right? Correct. Awesome. Awesome. So can, can you break in how kind of you made those steps and those climbs to management? Yeah, absolutely. So, so the ba- one of the big things was, you know, I started out, I was actually in the car business for, for about four and a half years before this. Yep. Um, I was selling cars at a local dealership here in town and, uh, you know, things were kind of getting stagnant. There was no, no one was really getting moved up through, through the company and, and, uh, Grant had actually, you know, he'd went over there, he'd worked with me in the past and he ended up going, going over to camping world. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know, I've, I've heard all the stories from all the other car guys that have, have went over there and come back. 
So I was, I was really leery of, of taking that jump from, from something I was used to, to kind of stepping outside of my comfort zone and getting into something a little bit different. Yeah. So, you know, especially after I'd seen so many guys that have been in the car business for so long, go try that and then come right back, Mm -hmm. you know? So in my head, it was just hard to wrap my head around as far as, you know, making that leap and actually sticking to it. Yeah. But, you know, he kept on, you know, he stayed persistent on, on trying to get me over there. And I went and visited him a couple of times before I even did it. So you know, I got my kind of tiptoed in there and kind of stuck my toe in the water, see what it was all about. And then, you know, I slowly, you know, after talking to him and, and kind of, you know, the, the, the increase in opportunity, I guess that was mm-hmm. there because I'd seen him kind of work his way through. Yeah. So that kind of opened my eyes to like, man, I've been stuck here for four and a half years and, and nothing's changing. You know, it's one of those things where is, is kind of a setting where people were more afraid of, I, th- I think management was more afraid of losing someone who's producing on the floor to take them off the floor and put them into management because yeah. they were afraid to not be able to replace those units. Yeah. No. And, and, and that I, I feel like that's one of the biggest things. A lot of management fears is promoting within. They'd rather find somebody who's not producing their paycheck uh, and, and bring in an outsider, but all, all in my experience, all you're going to do in that situation is piss off the people who's making yeah. you know, your paycheck. And, and that's, that's one thing when, when Grant called me, I, I, I had this brief conversation with him. I said, you know, I'd, I'd love to come up and have this opportunity to, to fill in for a, a finance position, but I, I want to make sure that I'm not taking somebody else who is there and deserves it. Right. And, and he, he assured me, he was like, don't get me wrong. I've got somebody in mind, but I don't think they will be a good fit. Right. And I was like, okay, that's all I needed to know. I just want to make sure I'm not stepping on anybody's toes right. because I've been in that situation. Right. You know, I've, I've been there and, and pounded it and worked my butt off to, to get that promotion and not get it. Right. You know, and it, it's so discouraging. And at that point you're just ready to walk out. You're yeah, ready to you leave. Hang you're, up your sales cleats yeah. and call it a night. Yeah. You're like, I'm, I'm out of here. Yeah, maybe I'm this done. wasn't, it wasn't for me. And all that self self doubt starts to kind of kick in. Okay. So, uh, before you got into car sales, what were you doing? Before I got into car sales, I was actually a co-owner of a local pizza joint here in town. Okay. Yep. The Kostaki's Pizzeria was the name. It was a it was a fun little project. Um, I kind of stumbled into it as as a manager starting out over there. I'd had some pizza business in my pat in my background starting out. Mm-hmm. So um, I got a phone call and and the it was a voicemail actually and the voicemail was like, hey, you know, I want to call you in for your second interview, but. Honestly, I just want to offer you the job. So that's kind of how, that's kind of how his voicemail went. I'm like, okay. So ended up trying that out. It was something I was used to, something I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it, it was a cool experience to be able to kind of get wrote in on the ownership. I didn't have to buy into ownership of this company. Oh, wow. It was for the time that I'd, I'd spent there already and the time that, or, and, and all the stuff that I, I kind of changed some things and some business practices that they were doing that kind of kind of opened the other owner's eyes up that said, Hey, maybe these guys know what the heck they're doing. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, I, I hate to bring up cause obviously you're not with them anymore. What happened? <laughs> so yeah, it was kind of a, a little bit of a rough story, but, um, everybody knows sometimes, you know, with, with businesses, you have some fallouts with, with your, with your partners. Mm-hmm. So, um, this thing, we opened up our second location. We weren't getting the support that we were wanting to get from, uh, what I was mostly the work hat workhorse of the, uh, of the operation. And I brought mm-hmm. another guy along with me too, from my hometown. And we kind of were, were running the place and getting everything up to par, hitting new numbers, doing new advertising, things like that, you know, yeah. stuff that was kind of falling stagnant with the, with the previous owner. Yeah. So, uh, we ended up, ended up, uh, See, well, how'd it go? It was more about, um, I guess, that they wanted to micromanage certain aspects of the business that they had no experience in. You know, oh, my yep. other partners, one of them was a lawyer. The other one did farm real estate. Mm-hmm. So they're those, pretty yeah, pretty distant were. to anything having to do with, them, with the pizza business. They probably, I don't know for a fact, but they may not have had any experience in, you know, in a restaurant to begin with. Yeah. They had fallen kind of backwards into this because they helped, uh, helped somebody get this business started and then they, they failed. And so they, this kind of fell into their lap and they're like, okay, what do we do with this now? Yeah. I, I, so that's, that's kind of the, where I walked into it at. Yeah. So Things were kind of getting set up. Um, so, for example, on a Friday night, we had one delivery driver to, oh, to take. So I, I come in on my first Friday and I look out and all these bags are sitting there ready to go for delivery. And they're, they've got pizza in them. And I was like, what, what are we waiting for on these? They're like, well, we only have one closing driver and he gets all the deliveries. 
So people were waiting an hour, hour and 45 minutes, two hours to get their food. And they probably weren't very happy. No. No, not at all. So, I mean, we doubled, tripled, quadrupled their their business as far as deliveries go by just changing one little thing. It's adding extra people, Mm -hmm. you know, just getting that, getting, getting it to where we could get our delivery times, you know, 30 minutes or so. Yeah. You know, that's, that's, that's pretty good. Yeah. And, and. I, I don't know if you know this. I come from a pizza background myself. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You mentioned that we, to me once before. We've talked yeah. about this maybe. Um, so my my dad, he was a, a district manager for uh, Pizza Hut. Mm-hmm. I hate to drop their name, but <laughs> he, he'd worked for Pizza Hut for 30 plus years. Um, and he had got me a job there, just bus boy washing dishes when I was like 14, 15 years right. old. And, and and to me, I worked two days a week. It wasn't a big deal. I liked the little bit of extra money I could go buy junk with, you right. know. And and then at sixteen, you know, I started full time, you know, full time mm-hmm. for a minor. And uh, I, I did. I, I worked there up until I graduated high school, and you know, all that summer until I went off to college. And I mean, I was I was with this one store for I mean, close to five years. Mm-hmm. And I, I'd done every position between server, cook, dishwasher, prep, uh, management. I mean, like I'd, I'd done the full spectrum. Yeah. And I mean, like I had bought in emotionally to that store. Right. So like I, I understood like, okay, we've got to keep food costs down. You know, we've got to keep delivery times down. Like yeah. well, we've got to keep our make table clean. Like you know, every, yeah. every aspect of it. And, and uh, obviously, of course, keeping customers happy. So I, I mean – when when you say you know you, you had one delivery driver on a Friday night, I cringe. I'm right, like, you know, man, it's like, like how's that ever going to work? We we had a minimal of three, yeah. like uh, uh, until like ten o'clock. Like you can't do that. Exactly. I, it blew my mind that, that there was still people willing to wait that long for their pizza, even though you tell them that hey, look, we, it's probably going to be an hour and a half, two hours. Mm-hmm. You know, so so there's kind of a double edged sword. So of course that means. Maybe we have a really good product here at this place. Mm-hmm. I was just getting started. I had no idea. Yeah. But the nice thing was everything was made from scratch. We made all of our sauces in-house. We did all that stuff in-house, fresh fresh prep vegetables every day. So things like that. That was kind of that was kind of a cool aspect of it. And I mm-hmm. I did kind of grow to learn more about it, of course, as as I got more involved and got promoted throughout the throughout that business. That yeah. that, you know, this is some pretty cool stuff here. This is this we've got something here. I thought we had something really nice. So the next the next step into that was we went to open up a second location in a, an arcade that was here in town. Okay. So it was an arcade bowling alley uh, on the other opposite side of town from where the original location was. So that, that being said, you know, I, I wanted it. We, we had talked with the other owners about growing the business as far as like, Hey, look, my check's not going to grow unless we grow as a business. Absolutely. So, so that was kind of the main focus to us was, okay, what can we do next? You know, what's our next step from here? Let's we've, we're established here at this location. We've survived this long at this location. Let's see about opening up a second location. So we had everything set up. We found the perfect place. It was right in this, right in the midst of all of the, uh, uh, student housing that was getting built. Oh yeah. So, I mean, we were right in the back pocket of all that. So this, this other store should have just been a juggernaut. Yeah. What ended up happening and another big thing is of course, you know, around this area you hear Shakespeare's pizza. Yeah. So that was my number one competition with Shakespeare's pizza in town. So everything I did was what can I do to become better than what Shakespeare's has become? Exactly. So with that being said, we, we decided, you know, let's open this up and all these people, all these guys thinking back, they, uh, from what I heard from the town stories, you know, the people would be like, yeah, we love Shakespeare's pizza because we grew up eating it as kids. And now we can, now we can go have a beer there as, as adults, mm-hmm. you know, and I wanted that, you know, so that was something that we tried to kind of get into. We tried to get with the, uh, with build build relationship with the college crowd we would do pizza parties like pop-up pizza parties at some of these new places that were just getting opened up as oh, far as awesome. apartment complexes yeah so we had a bunch of stuff like geared up towards that what happens next we miss our we miss our uh our open date oh, our grand no. opening no you can't do that the reason being our partners decide they want to come in and start micromanaging construction and, and uh, kitchen layout things no. that that they they did they were so distant from they didn't understand how that worked yeah so that that part was a little bit disheartening as far as missing that date the next big blow was that they didn't want to do a grand opening for the new date wait what yeah we had to pretty much strong arm them into doing a grand opening with uh with the uh, chamber of commerce here in town and make a big event of it why I had to push for that I don't know no 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 that that's that's like <laughs> business opening 101 like 
if you miss your open date, it's okay as long as you make up for it. Like mm-hmm. you, it, things happen, you know, construction and, and yeah. e- even in this case, micromanagement happens because it happens every day. <laughs> I mean, you've got to do your grand opening, your grand reveal, your your big poobah, yeah. if you will. Like you've got to make that appearance to the community. Absolutely. And, and with the Chamber of Commerce, I mean, you get in like on – the front page yeah. of the paper, like, hey, everybody, it's my ribbon check, cutting ceremony. Check this out, like, <laughs> new, new to Columbia, yeah. second location. Right. Ouch. Oh man, that's terrible. Yep. I didn't know that. Yep. And then so as, as kind of things kind of stacked up, one there was it seemed to be one thing after another, and and I I, I told my partners I was like, hey guys, look, um, same thing I told them before, as I as I always said, you guys, my check's not going to grow unless we grow as a company, mm-hmm. and I'm willing to put in the work. I was there at the store listening to people shake the doors trying to get in because they thought we were open because that's what, you know, our, our date was set as. And and then they didn't want it. They didn't want to do that. I ended up leaving and my, my other partner ended up leaving as well. Mm-hmm. Um, we were kind of the, the two guys that were in day to day operations at the place. Yeah. And we both ended up leaving about six months later, I was driving by and I look over and I was like, yeah, I just kind of wanted to pull into this parking lot, see what's going on with the old location. Pulled up in there. There's a sign on the door said that they're they're shut down. So that was about six months later. Wow. Both locations end up shutting down. Oh my gosh. Okay. So this this is gonna. I'm I'm just gonna go ahead and push it in there. Maybe a little yeah. bit earlier. <laughs> at at what point did you hit bottom of the bottle? It's 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 the segment I call, and it's kind of the sad and low point of it. So uh, obviously, like you're you joined up with these people to start a a pizza business or or keep going a pizza business right. i would i would guess yeah uh and and now they're kind of ruining your plan and your dream right right yeah that's i mean essentially you know um i don't i want to throw any shade that way but i mean um it was kind of like a kind of just like what do i do from here mm-hmm. you know I, i've always wanted to own my own business i've always wanted to go into business for myself and i always wanted to you know be able to have a pretty good income to where i could support my family and myself as well so absolutely american dream Woo-hoo. absolutely so that was that was one of those things like i was like man i was like what do i do from here you know pizza was what i knew i didn't i didn't know anything else yeah so it was kind of one of those things like i, I don't know what to do so what ended up happening for me is that um there was uh, there was an opening at a, at a car dealership okay. and I was, I went and applied and I got an interview and one of my roommates at the time was working at veterans United here in town. And he ended up working with somebody that worked at the Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram store here in town. Okay. So he's like, he's like, Hey, I'm, I work with this guy. He was the sales manager up there at the Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram store in town. He's like, he might still have some pull. You want me to talk to him? I said, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Let's go. Why not? You know, I already had an inter- interview at the at the Ford store, and the Ford store was kind of like the old store where everyone had the repeat referral customers. All the mm-hmm. old seasoned vets were there. Yeah. So it was kind of like, one of those like, man, like, what am I getting myself into? I had no idea. I'd never done anything like this before. So it was, it was uncharted territory for me. It was something new. But again, you know, it was like one of those things that just kind of jump into and see what happens. Yeah, well, and and I mean that that actually brings me up to uh, one of my next questions was who was the first person to actually get you into sales? And it sounds like you know that's, that's your buddy, you know. Yeah, so so what got me into I guess the originally into sales. So the first formal job that I had with sales was was definitely at, at Lost Valley Lake doing yeah. the tours. But before that, when I was still in high school, I had uh, kind of ventured into some multi-level marketing. Oh, dun, 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 pyramid scheme. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, as, as much as, you know, that, that's kind of what it is to most folks, but really for me, I can think back to it and not like, that's what I kind of like to do with everything is kind of, what can I, what can I take? What have I learned from this, from this situation? What can I bring into my next venture in life? So with that, it came with a lot of self-help stuff, um, a lot of support groups from from other members that were in there. So that side of it was really neat because that kind of 
built the structure for sales to me, uh, you know, like, you know, building rapport, um, you know, product knowledge, things like that. So that kind of opened the door for me to realize that. But the biggest thing I took from that, from the multi-level marketing was, was the self-help stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's one thing that they do better than probably any industry, it's the self-help, the stuff, you know, the reading the, the Jim Rohn's reading the, uh, you know, listening to the Grant Cardone, yeah. all that, all that kind of stuff, the self-help, you know, bettering yourself and gearing your mind for that business aspect of things. So that, that was one of the big things for me. That's awesome. And, and, uh, I love to hear that, uh, just, just because I mean, like there, there are so many, and, and I hate to, this isn't a bad thing and I don't want to like push those people away because th I'm not, I'm not knocking you, but there's a lot of those, you know, um, how did you say it? Multi marketing, multi level marketing, multi level marketing. Yeah, it sounds a little better than a pyramid it, scheme, doesn't it? It, it sounds <laughs> sounds a little bit better. I, I keep wanting to call it a pyramid scheme because that's what it is. But and and like I said, don't let me think I'm knocking you. But like some of these cosmetic companies, uh, and right. and I mean uh, supplement companies. I don't, I don't mm -hmm. want to throw any one underneath the bus, but right, right. I mean, there's so All many the keto companies yeah, and things like that exactly. that you see out there. Yeah, no, I, I completely get it. There, there's so many of those out there, and they're doing so well. Yeah, and that's the crazy thing yeah. because I mean, if you're on the front lines of of what's coming, you're doing great right now. Yeah, I mean, like so so many different products. I can't. I don't. I don't want to name any, but. I mean, so many different products between makeup and, and self-help, like you were saying, and, mm -hmm. and uh, supplements and, and, and everything being that, that multi-level scheme. Um, they're doing phenomenal right now. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's like, a huge industry. It's like they have formed the troops and they're hitting yeah. doors. I mean, like you're, you're going, the camaraderie you have there. You'd love to have in any like sales dealership, anything like that. Cause those guys, everyone's got everyone's back. Absolutely. They're all pumped up. They're excited to help each other out. So, uh, like I said, there's always something you can take from everyone as, as far as that stuff goes. And I, like I said, I learned a lot from that being my kind of like my groundwork to mm -hmm. my sales career. And so it was, it was kind of a cool experience because I got to take it in stride at my own pace. I wasn't, you know, getting my neck breathed down on by a manager or something like that, mm -hmm. you know, trying to hit quoted quotas and things like that. So that was kind of, that was kind of cool aspect of it. And I was really young too. So I was what, 17, I guess I was 18, 18 when that happened. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, with any, anything, if, if you do it for long periods of time, you're only going to get better at it. Exactly. If you stick with it, I mean, you're only going to get better. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's, that's my advice to anybody. If you truly want to be in a certain field, whether it's, you know, say medical, or if you want to be in, you know, automotive sales or automotive service, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, if you want to do anything and you can set your mind to it, do it and stick with it. Yeah. Don't ever give up. That's, Give yourself long enough thing. time to actually be able to measure the results. Absolutely. Don't just, you know, get in your feelings right off the bat and then boom, you're off. Yeah. I mean, as soon as you say die, as soon as you quit, it's over. I mean, you're, mm -hmm. you're done after that because you, you can't come back from that. No. I mean, if you try, you're just going to get devastated again and, and be done. Right. Right. So, okay. So, um, you, you've done multi-level marketing right. um, and, and then you've sold um, what I'm going to call timeshares. Ownerships. Own, own, ownerships. My they're, they're ownerships. <laughs> they're ownerships, not timeshares. <laughs> 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 um, and, and, and you sold cars. Uh, and, and in that meantime, you actually sold pizza. So from the transition from pizza to cars, um, I mean, how did you come back from being a partner to – being a sales associate. So one of the big things that I think I really realized was once I, I was, so I was a business owner at a really young age and that kind of took me into seeing kind of that sales is really like owning your own business within the business. Yep. I've got to come open my doors. just like the building had to come open their doors this morning. Mm-hmm. So I think that was one thing that I could really take from it. I think that's what kind of helped that transition over and really kind of stick. And even my, even my, my sales manager, and my GM before they would always, you know, talk to me about Oz, if you had somebody work in the frying machine and that you didn't want them looking over here off to the side, you know, paying attention to something else when they're focused when your job is to be the, the guy on the frying machine. 
Yeah. So it's just like, just like, you know, if it's your turn to be up, if you're, if you're up, you know, be attentive, be, do everything you can to make sure that you do your job in the dealership. Cause if everyone does their part, then everything runs smooth. If not, people got to pick up the slack, you know, then, then of course the snowball starts from there. Exactly. Now you being a sales manager, do you enforce that in your own dealership now? I mean, obviously you're sitting here saying it, but like, do you make sure that happens on a daily basis in your store? As far as everybody taking the open ownership and doing their part. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We hold people accountable at our dealership. We want to make sure that, that people are, are up and our customers are getting tended to the correct way. And we of course want to train our, 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 our sales associates to be able to handle customers and be mm-hmm. able to give them a great experience. Cause at the end of the day, it's all about that sales experience for the customer. It's not about yours because you do it every day. Mm-hmm. You need to be just as excited as the first day you were there. Exactly. And that, that, that was always my thing. And, and I've, I've actually tried to tell multiple people underneath me t- uh, and, and even those working beside me, like your excitement and, and Grant and me talked about this on, on his episode. Uh, it, it's all about a transfer of emotion. If you're going to be excited about it, then you've got to, you know, push that emotion onto them. Right. Because, you know, you you get to do this every day and it's real easy for you to go from uh, being, you know, uh, what's the word? Bland about it is what I want to say is, mm-hmm. you know, you're like, yep, this is the car. This is the camper. This is the couch. Whatever it is you sell, you get so just worn out on showing the same thing over and over again. Yeah. And if you can't make that exciting, you're you're not going to excite your customers because they're the ones who haven't seen it a million times. Absolutely. Or, and that's that's a big thing to me. I mean, it, not not only product knowledge but the excitement level. Right. If if you're not excited, they aren't either. Absolutely. No, you're 100% right. And and I think at the end of the day, if you can it's it's kind of something that's helped me along my sales career is is when I get that customer in my head, think, look, put yourself in this customer's shoes. So I don't care if it's, uh, you know, a, a 25 year old couple that just came in, hasn't camped before, mm-hmm. or if it's the guy that's, you know, worked his whole entire life to be able to retire and finally buy this motorhome that he's wanted and get yep. to go see the whole, whole United States, you know? Exactly. So if, if you can kind of put yourself in that mindset to, to think about where your customer's coming from and kind of through their eyes a little bit, it'll kind of make you a little bit more excited. So if someone's, you know, like you said, if we, like we said, if we just had that customer that, that has worked, you know, 60 years in his profession, finally is able to retire, has the means to be able to go hit the road. Mm -hmm. That's pretty exciting for that customer. That customer, it's a dream come true. Exactly. And, and I, I hate to say it because I know it's happened, maybe not at our store or, you know, one nearby, but somewhere he is, just walked into that dealership, pocket full of cash, ready to hit the road. He knows the units there, everything about it. And that sales person just was like, you want to see what? Yeah. what oh, yeah. That one. Yeah, it's out back. Let's go. Right. I mean, he is. I, I would be devastated at that point. Right. I, I would walk straight out the front door and be gone forever because there's no excitement and I'm walking in already knowing everything about it, knowing exactly where it's priced at online, you know, yeah. and, and I'm ready to do it today. And someone I, takes the wind out of your sales. Somebody, somebody takes the wind out and I'm like, well, I'm out. Yeah. I'm done. It, I, I would, I, I seriously would, I would be devastated at that. Sorry about that. Hey, ESPN. It's important. <laughs> Let me go and silence that real quick. My no apologies. big deal. I don't know if the mic's picked it up, but if not, we just heard Sports Center. So there we go. Um, There's a plug, Sports Center. We better get her cut. So you're you're in a sales manager's prison position now. Uh, you have obviously worked your way up in this industry. Where do you want to go from here? So I definitely would like to uh, work my way into the next step. Of course, being a general manager. Mm-hmm. You know, wherever that may entail, being. Um, Personally, I wouldn't mind a little warmer weather, maybe somewhere <laughs> along the coast. But, you know, I'll, I'm one of those guys that I can make the best of any situation, no matter where I'm at. You yeah. know, I can find friends. I can find things to do. So, I mean, for me, the next step is going to be, of course, you know, hitting that next step as far as becoming general manager somewhere and, you know, honing my craft as far as being able to, to you know, have a crew underneath me that believes in me, that knows, you know, that I'm, I've am i got their best interest at heart at all times. Absolutely. So that's, that's one of the biggest things for me is that, you know, you got to care about your people. Mm-hmm. You've got to really 
you know, once you get into management, it's, it becomes more of a psychological, uh, s- setting than, than like a sales setting, yeah. you know, cause it's all about keeping your people motivated and not the one thing that motivates person A is not going to motivate person B. Mm-hmm. So with that, with that being said, I mean, you've, you've got to kind of really get to know your people, know what drives them, know, you know, what they're, what, what they like to do in their spare time and kind of, you know, help push them up. Cause the, the better they do, the better I'll do. This is the way I always look at it. Mm-hmm. So if I can, if I can, you know, help change these guys' lives, help them, you know, work hard and, and let them know that, hey, look, you can become a sales manager. You can become a finance manager. You can become a general manager. You just got to put in the hard work and the time that, that it takes to get there. And Absolutely. You, and we can all do it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just a, it's a matter of persistence and, and, you know, bettering yourself daily and doing things, you know, every day that are going to make you a better, better person and then hone your craft. Yeah. Well, and, and, and I'm glad you said that because it it made me think, you know, for, for anybody that just started in sales, I I don't want you to think that, you know, general managers and sales managers and finance managers, or, you know, in, in our industry, that's what we relate to, but any type of management is, is a growing position Yeah. because those aren't just born positions. It's not like we just said, Hey, we're going to pick Joe off the street and you're the new manager. That's not how it works. Right. You've got to build your craft and you've got to build, you know, your, your relationship and, and build your community and your dealership, mm-hmm. whatever you're selling to get to that next level, right. you know, to get to that sales position, to get to the the management position, to get to, you know, general manager position and go even higher. Mm-hmm. You control how fast, or, or not how fast, but but how much you get to grow. Right. Because if you don't put it in the work, you're not going to get there. Yeah, absolutely right. Absolutely. I love it. Love it. Love it. So how do you stay on your grind? So every every morning when you wake up, you're you're rallying the troops. What what is it that keeps you getting out of bed every morning? So of course for me, my my big my big thing is supporting my family. And I want I want my family to be able to live comfortably and I feel like I owe it to be able to take care of my parents when they're older age too. So to me, that's one of the big things that motivates me and drives me is that, you know, the, the family aspect of it. I want to have a career, you know, I didn't, I didn't finish school. I didn't, I mean, I I got my, I graduated from high school, but I I was going to say, I'd hope so. (laughs) I did did that much. I did that much, but I mean, I don't have a degree. I don't even have an associate's degree. I I didn't get any certification at a technical school. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, with sales, it kind of, it really just changed my life as far as, you know, the things I could do, the things I could afford and, and without having to have, you know, a a four year degree without having to have a doctor, you know, you can make just as much money in sales as some of these people with these prestigious awards and these prestigious degrees, Mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've, and it's funny growing up because, you know, you get that instilled in your mind that everyone from the get go says, you know, work hard in school, go to college and get a good job. Well, I'm seeing now, you know, it's not, it's not just that easy. It's not a cookie cutter to where you can just do that. Yeah. And it just works out. You go to college and boom, you're, you're awarded. Here's your good job. Congratulations. You've went to college and you graduated. It doesn't quite work like that. No. So, I mean, there's several people that I know that have been in school and spent a lot more money than I have on school Mm -hmm. who are not making near the money not doing you know, not happy with what they're doing. And sometimes it's not even what they went to school for. Exactly. So that really opened my eyes in hindsight and kind of something that I would tell, you know, like the younger crowd is like, Hey, you know, you don't have to go by that mold. You know, this is sales is and everything you do in life is sales. Yeah. You know, so whether you're, if you're an author, if you're an author, no one knows who you are unless you're what? Best seller. Yeah, your best seller. Your yeah. best seller. I love that. I love that line. That's a that's a good one. I I you know? never thought about that, and I was trying to piece it together yeah. as you were saying it. You're a best seller author. Right. I love it. I right. love it. That's it, great. It comes down that's to that amazing. at the end of the day, you know. So that's just one of those <laughs> things you can think of. Like it's it's like you know everything. You know it doesn't matter if you could have the best grammar, you could have the best uh, best story, you could have the best idea for a story. But what's that matter if if you're not the if you don't if you're not on the bestseller list? It's, it, you're right. I love it. That's amazing. So. I love that point. I'm gonna have to write that down <laughs> because that 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 it means so much. That um, one resonates really well with people. You know, it really kind of brings things into perspective. Yeah, and 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 I mean, from from my background, you know, like I went to college. I did not graduate college. Probably yeah. similar to you, and. 
I I didn't I didn't ever um I hated college. I'm not gonna lie. I hated college. I always hated high school. I thought going to college was just the next step, and I didn't ever fit in. Like I, I didn't get into a fraternity. I, I, I college was not for me. Right. And and I mean for me, I went into the oil and gas industry because at the time that was where everybody said you can go make a lot of money. So that's where I went. I was like, boom, we're going to the oil and gas. I'm gonna work work hard in a hard hat. I don't right. I don't care. Right. Um and. It, when when the oil field died for me, I got into sales because that's what everybody said. You don't need a college mm-hmm. degree to go sell cars. You don't need a college degree to go sell anything. Right. You just got to have a good personality. Well, I have that. I've always had an amazing personality, you know? <laughs> no, I have been I, lying I, to you. No, I was uh, kidding. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. Whoa. <laughs> but, but no, seriously, like, I've, yeah. I feel like I've always had a good personality. Right. Even though Oz doesn't think so. <laughs> I'm just um, messing with you. Um, but seriously, like, I've always made friends with everybody, and that's how I felt I've always been good in sales right. and never even knew it. Because mm-hmm. I, I, you could have asked me six years ago, if I would ever be in the position I am where I have to dress up nice and meet people and be courteous and try and sell them something on the spot, and I would have laughed in your face. <laughs> you, you weren't that guy, huh? I was not that guy. Yeah. I, 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 Seriously, when I was in the oil field, I, I still have my hard hat up there. I, I, you can barely see it up there, but uh, <laughs> I, see it. Yeah. I, I wore muddy jeans. I wore steel toe boots. I wore flame retardant outfits. I mean... That was me every day. I got down, I got dirty, and I worked hard. Right. But it, and, and and this is how I felt, you know, that it brought me to this position now is because I know how to work hard, mm-hmm. and now I've got to know how to work hard and smile. Right. Yeah, exactly. So I, that's ex- I, I know where you're coming from from that because – you know, when I was in high school, I was packing drywall and throwing shingles for a, mm-hmm. for a lumber or for like a local, uh, uh, what is that? What is that called? Lumber yard, basically. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Lumber yeah. Yard. Hard, hardware store. Home lumber improvement yard. store. Yeah. There Home improvement store. There we we like There's it. a word. We'll find so, a word. Yeah. Uh, so that's what I did. And, and I was always that guy that I knew I could always work hard physically. But once you kind of learn to transfer that, that physical drive that you have to, to be able to Cause it takes, it takes a lot of mental grit to be able to get up every morning and, and know that you're going into a job that you're going to have to be there for eight hours mm-hmm. doing nothing but manual labor. And, and I, and we got up and we did it. We did those things and you kind of get to learn, you know, once I kind of got into sales, it was, it was kind of like the same type of thing, except for it was more of, of a mental Olympics. Yeah. You know, it's, it's more, more of, you know, a, a mental state instead of a physical state as far as working hard. But well, you have to work just as hard mentally as you were willing to work physically. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I I still remember the first day um, I I got into a, a true sales position. It was at a small dealership in Heber Springs, Arkansas, and after two or three days of trying to sell something, I was more exhausted than working a 18 hour shift out in the oil field yep. and I could not explain it. I spent eight hours in the dealership, came home and, and you can ask my wife, I came home, drank a beer, ate whatever she had made and passed out on the couch. I was mentally exhausted Yeah, and it had nothing to do with my physical ability. Right. I was probably in the best shape of my life at that point, <laughs> and I was mentally drained and could not stay awake. Was I was so game. dead. It was probably like seven thirty, eight o'clock at night. Right. I was just done. Right. And I knew I had to wake up and do it again. Yep. Wake up and then rinse, <laughs> rinse and repeat. Rinse and repeat. You yep. are correct. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what does your sales process look like today? And, and that's, that's speaking generally, not, not specifically. Okay. So the sales process, uh, for where we work right now, work out, we work on an up rotation. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, we have a closed off lot with our campers in them. People have to walk in our front door. Um, we've got a person that's up and the person that's on deck. Okay. So, uh, from the get go, of course you meet and greet, 
And then we do, you know, what most industries will call the fact finding. Yeah. Um, so you get to build a little bit of rapport with your customer, find out exactly why they came in, yeah. um, find out, you know, what their needs and wants are as far as what they're looking for in a camper, um, where they're going to be using it, how they're going to be using it. So you can get them on the right one that's going to fit all their needs and their budget. Um, you know, I always preach to my guys, you know, it's important to ask the budget questions. Absolutely. You know, don't be afraid of that budget question. It's a hard question to ask, you know, from someone you just met about five minutes ago or sometimes less. Well, and I I never understood that because I was never afraid to ask anybody, how much are you willing to spend? Yeah. And, you know, and and when I was feeling ballsy, I would go, how much are you willing to spend today? Mm -hmm. And I I don't know how many old men said, I'll spend a dollar today. And I'd be like, that's my tip. Thank you very much. We'll go home later. (laughs) But, um, you know, like... I I never had a problem with that budget question because in in my eyes I never want to show them more than what they are wanting to pay. Right. I'm the the guy could sit there and be telling me he is looking for the most expensive truck on the lot. I have a twenty thousand dollar budget. Well, that's not the most expensive truck on the lot or the most expensive camper on the lot. Right. It doesn't matter. I've got to find something in twenty thousand dollar range. Mm-hmm. And I have no problem trying to bump you to twenty five or possibly even thirty yeah. if it's the right unit. Absolutely. Yeah, so so you know, we find out what they want, what they need. Um, then we'll go, we'll get a few units together that, that we think that they'll that it's gonna fit all their needs and their budget. Um, we'll take them out, do a demonstration on the unit, make mm-hmm. sure that they uh, that they light up on everything, make sure we hit all the buttons for them. Yeah. You always want to ask your trial close questions while you're out there with the customer, you know, sell on your feet, closing your seat. Yeah. So you're always you know, when you're out there, you're you're building more rapport with them while you're out there because there's a lot of downtime in between, you know, walking from camper A to camper B. So you're still kind of building that rapport, but you also want to hit all the hot buttons the things that they told you inside that they really liked that they really wanted to have in this thing make sure you spend a little bit more time on those things when you're explaining this to these people yeah so so what is your favorite trial close my favorite trial close um that'd be folks it looks like this is the perfect unit for you guys if numbers are agreeable are you guys ready to take this thing home today yes Oz. yes i am great follow me <laughs> let's go get the paperwork done let's do it all right yeah you know, it, it, and it doesn't have to be extravagant. It doesn't have to be super witty. You know, it's just, it just one of those things that just needs to be done, period. Mm-hmm. You know, as long it you don't have to be a wizard at it. You don't have to make it sound crazy. It's just, you just have to make sure you ask those questions. Just like you're saying, you shouldn't be afraid to ask those budget questions because it's going to do nothing but help you. Uh, yeah. And, and help them it, in the long run. Yes. You don't want to get somebody excited about a unit and then turns out it's $300 out of their budget. Yeah. And, and that's what I never understood because I, in, in, in all my times that I've tried to train a new salesperson or tried to help a salesperson out and, and give them some of the knowledge that I've learned over the years, it, it's never made sense to me why they were always scared to ask the budget questions. Right. They've walked in there knowing they want to look at something to purchase. Right. It doesn't make sense to me not to ask how much are you wanting to spend? Right. And I know you'll get objections with that. Oh, no, 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 no. We just want to look. We just want to look. I don't know how many times I've heard that. And I never get, I, I've always gotten over it. I've, I've Absolutely. A, what do you want to look at? And, and the, another big thing too is I, the, what I have trouble with with new salespeople is they're a, they're, they will make objections in their head that they might never even cross. Absolutely. The, so the, going back to that budget question, mm-hmm. they're afraid to ask that question because they don't know what the customer is going to say. They, they feel like maybe their personal situation is the same as his customers. But nine times out of ten, you ask that question, you get the answer to it. Yeah. But uh, but even better than that, nine times out of ten, ten times out of ten, if you don't ask that question, you're not going to get the answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. So absolutely, it, it's one of those things. They're just a they're they're building they're building objections in their head that they'll never even have to cross. Mm-hmm. Cross that bridge when you get there. Don't don't fret about it. Don't let it throw you off your game and make you feel all weird and awkward, just because you don't know. Yeah, so, exactly. I mean, just ask it and take it in stride. That's the that's a big thing. Just take it in stride and go, go with the flow. Talk to talk to these people. Ask the questions that need to be asked, because there's a reason. There's a process in place, and chances are it works. Yeah, absolutely. So so finishing up that process, I think mm-hmm. we got to budget. And we got way distracted. <laughs> budget question is a big thing. So please ask your budget. Always questions. ask your budget question. Okay, so so from 
uh, you know, we're, we're out on the lot. We're asking those trial close questions and say we found the perfect one. Where does the process take us from there? So we found the perfect unit. We'll come in, we'll set the customer down get them something to drink, offer them, you know, let them know where the restrooms are. Let them know, just, just hang tight for just a second. I'm going to go get these numbers put together for you and we'll see if we can make these, make this thing fit in your budget and you can take it home today. Awesome. It's all about today business because at the end of the day, if so, if you if you show somebody, if you don't ask that budget question from the get go, you show them something that's way out of their price range that they don't budget for. And maybe that they can they can probably afford it. But being in the industry we're in, it's a leisure activity. It's not something that you want to you know spend a big chunk of change in doing. It's going to supposed to be a getaway for you, a cheap mm-hmm. getaway. So um, with 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 asking those questions, sometimes you kind of weed yourself out out of uh i kind of almost forgot where i was going with that one <laughs> <laughs> hey it but, happens so we're we're talking about closing yeah and we're talking about those those budget questions right. and and where it gets to right 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 so so yeah um once you once you get them back inside you know you know their budget because once you once you tell them that hey look here's the price on this i know it's 300 dollars out of your budget they're going to go down the street they're going to go buy from someone else you've already done all the hard work from them for them. Um, so, th- you know, they're going to not want to show face back with you. They're embarrassed, mm-hmm. you know, at this point. So it, it's a really hard recovery to come back from if you, if you kind of don't ask that question. So there's, there's a lot of times you want to try to lock everything down same day, just because this, this, in this, this day and age, anybody can buy anything online. Mm-hmm. You can go right down the street and get something, the same thing that you were showing them before. Or, you know, you've done educated them and they found out, hey, I can't afford this model. It doesn't fit in my budget. So I'm going to go to the guy down the street and tell them, hey, look, I know what I want. I want something that's in this price range. They're just going to tell them everything that you've worked so hard to try to figure out. Yep, exactly. And they're going to be embarrassed to come see you again. Yeah. And 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 I've been in that situation so many times when I was, uh, you know, brand new into this industry and brand new into, uh, you know, indirect sales, I guess you would call it. Um, and... I had so many customers that I would follow up with and call and be like, Hey, you know, I've still got that unit or I've still got that vehicle. Uh, you know, we, we've cut a little bit off the price maybe, or, you know, we think we can keep you in these payments and they are like, no, 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 no. We can't do it. Sorry. You know, man, let's say you do get the sale though. Let's say you do get the sale. mm -hmm. What do you end up doing? You take all the gross out. You, yeah. No one makes a dime, you know. So you 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 set yourself up for failure from the get go by you know not asking the simple questions that that are that you need to know to to make sure that you're helping your customer out in the right way. Because at the end of the day, it's got to you got to think it's all coming back to their customer experience. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Know? And how do they feel? How are you making them feel? Do you make them feel like maybe they can't afford something? That's not a good feeling to have. Yeah. Do you land them on something that they love and they can afford? Now we're in a lot better situation. Exactly. Now we've got a way to go. Now we've got some emotion into this. Mm-hmm. So once you get that emotion built up, it's kind of hard to say no to something when one, it fits everything that they were looking for. It's under their budget or at their budget and, and they're ready to go. You know, it's, it's one of those things that you, you want. It's like the perfect setup, like yeah. that perfect volley in volleyball. And you get, you're waiting for that spike. Yeah, exactly. And, and I mean, with, with any, sales process, whether it, it, any different form of sales, everybody has a sales process mm-hmm. and, and it's different just a little bit, but for the most part, it's the same thing. Right. And I, I figured that out and it, it's crazy to me how many salespeople uh, are afraid to ask the right questions, to ask trial close questions, to ask what's wrong or why. Yeah. And, and uh, throughout the sales process, you're supposed to do all of those. Yeah. You're just asking questions, guys. We're friends now. You don't understand. We've just built this rapport. We talked about, you know, the game last Saturday. It was mm-hmm. amazing. Oh, man. Yeah. Our kids go to Little League, whatever. Yeah. Doesn't matter. You've built the rapport. You have earned yourself the right to ask why. Yeah. Why is the best? It's a three letter word. It is the best question you can ever ask in any industry, in any sales position. Why? Take notes from your three year olds. Exactly. 
Your three-year-old will ask you why three million times, <laughs> and you, I promise you, you have an answer until it comes down to, because I said so. And if I don't get it because I said so, or I don't want it, you've got your answer. All right. Until then, it's all BS. Yeah. Almost cursed. Sorry. Uh-oh. Almost cursed. <laughs> I was getting excited. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. Yeah. So- when did you realize you loved being in a sales position? Um, let's see. That'd probably have to be when I was selling cars, just because it wasn't that same mundane structure of clocking in, clocking out. Every situation was a little bit different. You know, you had to kind of be able to think on your feet a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. It just and it, it built a lot more confidence in my everyday life. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there wasn't a single point in which I realized, oh, hey, yeah, this is it. It was just one of those things that I kind of grew to like. You know, it, it, it started out slow, like something new that I was getting into, but I've always been someone that kind of likes to learn new things and kind of, you know, see where that takes me. You know, it, it's a little bit nerve wracking at first and kind of scary, <laughs> but you know, once you kind of take that step and that leap of faith, you know, you just got to just kind of keep grinding. Like we talked about earlier, mm-hmm. you just got to stick with it long enough to see some results. Well, whether and, those results are good or bad, you got to stick with it long enough to be able to measure them. Exactly. And and that was always me. And I always dove in my my I was a product knowledge salesperson. Mm-hmm. I love telling people about the product so much that they loved it and would buy it without remorse. You right. know, like I, I would tell them every increment, every detail, every feature so that so much that it, it, it would build the value that when I f- presented that pencil, there would be little to no argument. They'd right. be like, yeah, that that's amazing. You, you just did X amount of dollars off the price. Awesome. We'll take it today. Right. You could, that's what I love to hear. Let's go. Yeah, absolutely. You know? So, I, I mean, that, that's why I loved getting into sales mm-hmm. and, and I, I completely understand that. So, um, how has your job affected your relationship in home life? So with my relationship at home life, I've always worked long hours, you mm-hmm. know, um, even when I was in, when I was in the restaurant industry, mm-hmm. you know, even when I wasn't at work, I was dealing with work problems. Yeah. So, you know, a Sunday comes around, I'm off work watching the football game and you get a phone call say, Hey, our walk-ins out. Oh, geez. So now I got to pay time and a half to have somebody come fix it on a Sunday so that I don't lose out on thousands of dollars of food. That's going to go bad in my walk in. Yeah. That, that goes back to the food cost, what we, you know, mentioned <laughs> in like minute three, <laughs> if you need reference. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, that was, that was one of the things though. Like, you know, I've always, the long hours wasn't something new to me. The thing I think that took the biggest toll on me was that mental strain and trying to figure out how I could, how, how to juggle that and not bring it home with me. Yeah. You know, so I've learned, I've learned a lot about, you know, just leaving my work life at work and then, you know, spending my time with my family when I get home, you know, enjoying the time that I have there and then going right back into it. You know, I'm, I'm, I can kind of switch you on and off when it comes to things like that. Well, you know, it's, it's a tough thing. Some people absolutely. can, some people can't, you know, mm-hmm. but I guess I, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be able to, it's one of those things that I don't really juggle and I don't have a really big problem with. Yeah. And, and I know so many good you know, salespeople that have a problem with that. And it, it's, it's so hard to be able to turn that off switch mm-hmm. and on switch on. And I don't know how many times, because I, I was always a personal salesperson. I love product knowledge and love connecting with my, my, uh, customers too much. Yeah. And it became a problem because, mm-hmm. And I've got some great customers out there. Don't get me wrong. I had a couple come to my wedding. It was amazing. <laughs> like awesome. I, I, I sold them uh, back when I was selling Chrysler. I sold them a Jeep Wrangler. Uh, he would come into the dealership every time he'd drive by and just talk to me about his Jeep, yeah. talk to me about his wife, his home life, it, just keep up with me, bought me lunch a couple times. Nice. Like, l- love those types of customers. Absolutely. You, you will never get a better customer than the one you treat the best. Yep. But uh, at the same time, you you can get those problem customers and they've got your cell phone number and they'll text you and call you or email you at all hours of the night. It doesn't matter to them because they have a problem and they need to tell you about it. Right. And I always hated that because, I I mean, when I get off work and I'm left the dealership, I hated answering my phone, Mm -hmm. but I would always do it. Right. 
And that was one thing that affected my relationship uh, with, with me and my wife because I, I, you know, I work long hours. I get up early. I, I come home late and, and, you know, sometimes dinner's cold. Sometimes <laughs> it's hot when she's, you know, not mad at me, but <laughs> uh, I mean, every time my phone rang, I always feared if it wasn't like close friend, my dad and my mom, you know, so, right. cause I was like, it's a customer and I'm going to have to answer it. My wife's going to get mad. Uh-huh. And I would go, Oh, okay. Hey, Mr. Smith, how's it going? Yeah. Yeah. Your truck broke down. Well, did you buy a warranty? No, you didn't buy a warranty. Okay. I can't help you. Sorry. Bye. You know, <laughs> and I hate to be that guy, but like I'm at home, right? It's 10 o'clock at night. I've got to get up and go do this tomorrow. If you mm-hmm. really want me to, I will call you back tomorrow and try and help you with your problem. Right. I can't do that right now. Right. Yeah. And you've got to be able to have that separation, you know, mm-hmm. and, and everyone's threshold's a little bit different. You know, some people, you know, and, and always take care of your customer, you know, inside and outside of work. I know that's that it's, it's kind of taboo thing, but it's one of those things that, it is what it is. You're in sales. This is what you signed up for. Mm-hmm. You've got to take care of your customers, you know, and if you want to be extremely successful at it, you've got to do it on, on off hour times too. Absolutely. So whether that's answering a lead, whether that's uh, following up with a customer, whether that's, you know, calling a customer back that called you, even though it was after work, mm-hmm. you know, we, we've got to do it. So, yeah. and, and don't get me wrong. I can complain about it all day long, but I don't know how many times I've gone that extra mile. And if that is anything I can I can promote to anybody who is new to sales or trying to get into sales, go that extra mile for every single customer and it will pay you millions uh, in, in referrals and in repeats in everything you can do. If you go that extra mile for your customer and do small little things, they remember it, they appreciate it and they'll tell everybody about it. And you, and you said it exactly right. The, the biggest thing is the biggest thing is the smallest thing. Absolutely. So it's, it's that customer that you said calls saying his trucks broke down. Well, I'm sorry, sir. You know, I apologize that that happened to you. That's unfortunate. I'm going to do everything I can to help you out. Unfortunately, the dealership's closed right now. I don't have any contact. I, I'm not a mechanic. I can't come help you right now. If I if I could, exactly. I would. I just can't. Yep. And it's as simple as a phone call just like that. It doesn't take more than five minutes out of your day, mm-hmm. probably five seconds, probably 30 seconds. You know, it's not a lot of time out of your day. It's not a big hiccup in, in things that are going on. Exactly. It's, 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 it's the old adage, you know, the things that are easy to do are the things that are easy not to do. <laughs> so yep. if you're not taking care of your customers, other people will be. So just, just kind of kind of take take that take pride in what you do try to be that guy for your customer yeah you know so that that's that's kind of the kind of a focus point too you know just just try to do as much as you can it doesn't take a lot of effort doesn't take a lot of time out of your day to answer that phone call or answer a text message from a customer just let them know you know if there's something you can do for them right then great do it for them get it done get it out of the way if you can't let them know hey look i i i, I saw you called me Sorry, I missed your call or just take their call when you get it Yeah, and just let them know, Hey, look, I'm here for you. I'm going to, I'm going to do everything I can to help you out. Unfortunately, there's nothing I can do for you at this moment. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's, that was one of the reasons why I never cared to give out my personal cell phone number because I knew in the event of a crisis, they're going to call me, they're going to text me in odd hours when I'm off work. But I wanted them to know that I wasn't only selling them either a vehicle or a camper or a protection product. I was selling them me. Yep. And I am there to help them through whatever crisis they have with what they are purchasing. Mm -hmm. And that means more to me than anything. Absolutely. And, and that's why I, I, and I, I have a big heart anyways, and that's, yeah. that's a problem in sales in some aspects, <laughs> but, no, I understand that. uh, like I, I have always been that I want to take care of you mm-hmm. and that's why I, I feel like I've, I've been successful here right like in, in, in a, any sales position I've been in, I, I've always strived because I will truly want to take care of my customers yeah. and that I feel like that is a minimal of what it takes. And you're, and you're the only one that can answer that question as far as look yourself in the eyes in the mirror and say, hey, 
did, my, did I do everything I could have or did I, mm-hmm. did I not? Yeah. Because yeah. you can tell your sales managers all day long that, oh, yeah, I did everything oh, I could yeah, with these I tried guys. so hard. I've done so much. I've answered all their calls. But did you really? But did you really? Did, you know, did of you course you can that say that. Phone but phone. at the end of the day, you know, your 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 Pete Repurl customers, your your rapport that you build with these folks and, and how much you've helped them afterwards is, is going to go, you know, leaps and bounds as far as, you know, your sales career goes. Absolutely. Okay. Oz for, yep. for, for finishing up last, last couple of minutes of this podcast. Yeah. Um, if you had a new salesperson sitting in front of you, I, I give me two, three good minutes of what you would preach to them to go out and either close that customer, sell that customer, or greet that customer. Just give me that best motivation you've got for for that new salesperson or you know somebody who's struggling right now to 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 close that customer. To close a customer, um, just tell them, look, look, you've you've come this far, you've done all the work, we've done all the training that you need to have done. Um, you've, you're, you've gotten into an industry that's, that's going to pay you for your work. That's going to pay you really well. So you've, you've put in the time, you've honed your craft. Let's get in here. Let's, let's go out there with confidence, present these numbers. They're getting a great deal and you need to believe that they're getting a great deal and that you need to believe in your product too. If at the end of the day, if you can't believe in your product and you don't believe that you're giving it to them at a good price, then, then you're just, you're, you're baloney. Mm. You're, you're not, you're not selling anything at that point. You know, sales has become, for me, sales has become a kind of a, a huge change of aspect in my whole entire life because, you know, if I was talking to a new salesperson as far as, you know, look, you've made the right decision, you've decided to get into sales. Now that you're into sales, let's work on, let's work on, you know, let's, let's, let's work on one, your, your skills. So are you doing the, are you reading the books you need to be reading? Are you, are you working with, uh, listening to the podcast you need to be listening to? Are you watching, uh, these successful folks and trying to emulate what they do and pick up little pieces that, that relate to you personally that you can pick up and not feel foreign to you. Mm -hmm. Um, so with me, as far as a new salesperson coming in, um, you need to be one glad that you jumped into sales because like we talked about earlier, you don't have to have a degree. You don't have to spend thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars to earn the same income that some of these doctors and lawyers are making. Mm-hmm. So you've already made the first jump. Next step is you got to invest in yourself. Learn learn about your product because you're only going to be nervous and you're only going to be scared if you don't know what you're getting into. Mm-hmm. If you have full confidence of what you're selling, if you know the ins and out of every aspect of what you're selling, there's not going to be a single customer that walks in the door that's going to know more than you. So if you if you're at that point or you can get yourself to that point, you're going to be one, you're going to be a killer on the floor because you're going to know everything about your product. You're going to be able to answer any question anybody throws at you and you're going to be able to do it with confidence. You're going to be a monster. What that's going to do for you in the end of the day, you're going to one, you're going to be making a ton of money. You're going to be able to provide for your family. Your wife can stay at home with the kids and, and raise your kids instead of having to throw them into a daycare that you're going to pay an arm and a leg for. Yep. Um, you mean it's it to me it's it's gave me it gave me a bunch of confidence confidence that I didn't have before um, I probably never would have been able to get in front of you know a situation like this on a podcast and <laughs> and be able to be able to talk as freely as I have about it because it's one of the things that I it, I enjoy doing it I love training I love going through that stuff with folks and helping mm-hmm. helping them build their build their you know sales career. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd like to build up somebody to, you know, to take my position as I move up, you know, things, yeah. things like that. Um, you know, so looking back at it, seeing that you can make what these lawyers and doctors are making without having to have a degree, without having to spend four years of your life doing that. If you spend four years of your life working on sales as much as some of these folks, you know, spend on a degree that they'll never use. Yeah. You are going to be able to write your own check. Absolutely. At the end of the day, you're going to be able to write your own check. You're going to be, you're going to have a career that's more satisfactory than, than anything you've ever done. Um, and it, like I said, at the end of the day, it affords you an opportunity to, to earn a living for your family, earn a great living for you. Um, if you've ever thought about trying to own your own business, sales is a hundred percent owning your own business inside of a business. Mm -hmm. You're given a management staff, you're given an inventory, you're given a computer, you're given a phone, you're given a roof over your head and you're given advertising, bringing customers into your door Mm -hmm. for you to work on. So if, if you're not willing to open your doors, 
not the not the dealership doors. If you're not willing to open up your doors and say, hey, I'm here today. I'm invested. I got here early. I'm ready to go. You know, I'm open for business myself. Then, I mean, you, you, you probably wouldn't make it in a regular business, you know, brick and mortar business if you're trying to start your own business. Mm -hmm. So it, it's uh, I think it's really neat for sales folks as far as being able to uh, start your own business or at least get a taste for what your what owning your own business would be like because you have to do all the things to be successful as you would in a regular business. Yeah. You have to know your product. You have to follow up with your customers. You have to give good customer service. You have to be available. All those things you have to, you have to do these in order to run a regular business. So it's a very nice stepping stone. If it's something that maybe you don't want to be in, you know, sell cars, maybe you don't want to sell campers. Maybe you don't want to sell boats. Maybe that's not it but maybe this could be the stepping stone to get you to where you want to go. Absolutely. So at the end of the day, I think sales, for, at least for me, it's been an, an incredible experience. It's been an awesome journey. And I mean, I'm still, you know, in my journey as far as this goes mm -hmm. and it's been exciting going through it. I've learned a lot. I've met a lot of awesome people, lifelong friends. So I've got nothing good, nothing but good things to say about sales and, and where it's taken me and where, where I came from. So it's, it's been exciting for me. And like I said, at the end of the day, you get a, a whole new self confidence level to where you can go out and do things you never thought you could have done before, earn more money than you've ever earned before. At least that's how it's been in my experience. And, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to transfer that, you know, opportunity over to other people and see them be successful. So, and now my success is in their success. Yeah. So seeing other people that, you know, I've got a guy that he came from the restaurant industry, never sold before. It's, it's cool watching him grow into a salesperson, you know, we're mm -hmm. still fine tuning things. We're still, you know, stumbling along the way, but at the end of the day, he hasn't given up and he's not going to. So, you know, little things like that, when you see people grow and see what their potential is, you start to grow as a person yourself. So, I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of sales for me. Yeah. And I, I love it. I love it. That, that was absolutely amazing. Woo. Gave me chills. Woo. Um, so Oz, thank you so much for coming on my podcast. No I appreciate problem. it so much. Um, if, if anybody has not checked out, uh, go ahead and grab you a six pack of lookout from Longboat brewing company. Um, and we will catch you next time on the salesman's guide to beer and business. And, this man right here just gave me goosebumps. I can't, I can't lie. Hey man, I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, man. Thank you so much, everybody. Y'all have a great evening. Helping the customer buy. Helping him to know the product. Helping him see sales features that he in turn can use to sell. That's part of selling. How well could you do it?